time past, uh, John Hunt, the so-called founder of Huntsville, was thought of as a woodsman, a hunter, a wanderer, a man dressed in buckskin, a poor manager of his land and money. And the story was often told of how Leroy Pope uh, had swindled Hunt out of his land, and how Hunt had cleared, uh, that he had cleared by the big spring, and that Hunt had stolen other people's logs to build his house. Um, Ann Royal, who was a traveling journalist, and I put slash gossip columnist, wrote <laughs> in 1818, she traveled all around, wrote a lot of stuff. She said that John Hunt, standing five foot ten inches in height, his 180 pounds were a mass of flexible steel. His courage and endurance were immeasurable. He was fond of hardships, adventure, and daring, but he was valued most among those early frontiersmen for his caution. Now that was her view. None was sure how long he stayed in Huntsville, or when he died, or where he was buried. The early records of Huntsville are lost. They've disappeared, and other problems caused the research to go astray here. It was really a hard problem, because uh, the very common names, John and Hunt, made it trouble. And his name is John Hunt, his father's name is John Hunt, his son's name is John Hunt, and his cousin's name is John Hunt. I said, when they have the family reunion, and they don't have to wear name tags. <laughs> I started in North Carolina, and I found the truth about him to be quite different than that we all have thought through the years. My wife and I visited his home in Tazewell. We visited a town named Rogersville there in Tennessee. We visited the state archives in Raleigh and a number of places he had worked and lived. Hunt was born about 1750 in Bencastle County, now Buttercock County in Virginia. Not much was known about his wife. There have been people who told who his wife is, but it didn't come up in the, in the work I did. I really don't know who she was of my own, own work. The family moved 180 miles south to Granville County, North Carolina, near Chapel Hill in 17, seven, in 1768. Now that's right along here, right in black. Um, that same, uh, he was, uh, while he was there, he was in the militia in 1771 in Granville County. He was near a relative, Memican Hunt, a cousin. Uh, Memican had served one time as the treasurer of North Carolina. He was a well connected uh, someone for Hunt to know there in Granville County. He introduced him to a lot of the movers and shakers of the community and of the North Carolina government when it was meeting in nearby Hillsborough. John Hunt did a lot of things. He he signed an oath. Uh, this is this is uh, instead of the ruffian clothes, I wanted to show about what some would wear in that in that period who was mi mixing around with the treasure of North Carolina. Uh, he signed an oath of support for the state of North Carolina in 1777. And that same year, they moved to the mountains. The mountains included what will be Tennessee, Washington County, North Carolina, in the extreme northeastern part of what will be Tennessee. This is Washington County. As the counties were formed and divided, and I'm just going to show you here, as, as these uh, as these counties divided, you can see what's happening there. Washington County was a real big county. Hawkins, Sullivan, and so on up here. That's the center of our activity. One more time, Jane. And uh, he, he, uh, and as these counties were formed and divided and so on, he never moved. Yet he lived in Washington County, Claiborne County, Hawkins County. He lived in North Carolina. He lived in Tennessee. He also lived in that short-lived little state called the land south of the Ohio River, which later became Tennessee. He never moved. It's true that counties and states have ancestors. All right, he's there, and in 1787, he was appointed the sheriff of Hawkins County. This, this is, uh, it says Claiborne County, but here is his town right here. It, it, it became, this is Claiborne County with this map drawn, but that, was Hawkins County, so has it. That's home. He was appointed the sheriff of Hawkins County by the governor, 
1790, the governor of that short little state that I mentioned, the territory south of the River Ohio, appointed Hunt captain of militia, and his brother-in-law, David Larkin, and, and he were sworn in in Rogersville. Hunt also held a part-time, a part-time, but steady job as the clerk of the House of Commons of the North Carolina legislature. <laughs> From 1777 until 1789, except for one year, 1786, he served the House in many ways. He dealt with audits of money spent. He arranged for the printing of laws and journals of meetings. He paid reenlistment bonuses to officers in the Continental Army. He signed for the House of All, uh, all Resolutions, Appointments, and Messages. This is uh, taken from that, uh, that group of information gathered about the activities of the legislature. And here, John Hunt, uh, the governor is writing to John Hunt. Now, what he's telling him is to exchange, uh, take money, exchange it for cash or tobacco, and work on getting printing of the laws and journals. Okay? This is a note uh, which John Hunt has written to, to deliver to the Senate, telling them that they have agreed with the, that they have read and accepted the activity sent to them by the Senate. It's uh, by order of John Hunt, clerk of the House of Commons, C H C. One more time, Jake. All right, here is another one where John Hunt has written to Governor Johnson, and they're talking again about purchasing tobacco and all sorts of activities here. Uh, I, I could I could show y'all three hours of this stuff. You just can't believe how much of it's there. Um, all right, one more tip, please. Here is where uh, he is being commended for annually considerable trouble, risk, and expense, keeping possession and moving, and so on. The, uh, the, the General Assembly had omitted to give him any money. One more change. And here they decide that they will give him 25, or 25 pounds. The committee are of the opinion that he'd be allowed 25 pounds. So he would pay 25 pounds for that extra service he provided. One more. And in this one, he is commended. For not paying a member, John Hunt acquitted himself with great, with great propriety when his secretary, he refused to grant to William Blunt a traveling charges. He only traveled from Pitt, not from Tennessee. So uh, that uh, that's just examples of the things we saw in these, in these books. One more slide, please. He corresponded with the governor, officers of the federal government, the state treasurer, and he set up payments to the legislature. Here's a special thing. Uh, Governor Richard Caswell writes to Minikin Hunt, his cousin, and he says, if you've received any accounts lately from Mr. John Hunt respecting the printing of the laws, I shall be much obliged to you to inform me. Your servant, R. Caswell. Sorry, Jane. Three days later, Minikin Hunt replies, I happen to be able to take up your warrant and... Um, Draw in favor of John Hunt, and as soon as it was presented, it is now almost a month since hearing anything from him. He was endeavoring to exchange his money for tobacco or hard money. I hope this has been affected, and that before now, he has got this printing business in some forwardness. He had been sent from Hillsborough, near Raleigh, to New Bern, way over on the coast, to have the laws printed. It's very important that they print the laws as soon as possible after a session so people know what the laws are. Uh, and why he had to go to a printer in Newburgh, I have not figured out. There were printers all around. But this guy was the chosen printer for that time. So here he is over there without anything but the prints it printed by North Carolina. The printer won't accept it. He's trying to exchange it for tobacco, he says. Tobacco was the currency. But he said, his money, trying to exchange his money for tobacco or hard money. The printer says, bring me something real and I'll print them for you. <laughs> so that's the story on that. That one little incident there. David, what yeah. does hard money be? Hard money would be coin. It would be coins of some sort. And the king had ruled that no colony could make coins. They could print money, but they could not make coins. I want to read you just a paragraph from the book I, that we worked on here uh, about that. The paragraph says, cash money was an endless problem during Huntsville's earliest years. Pioneers could not deal with deciphering the values of different monetary systems that circulated. 
Spanish doubloons, dollars, caves, quarters, pistolines, and picayunes. Other banknotes often appeared, but most citizens preferred hard money. Often debts were paid with IOUs, slaves, or real estate. Tobacco served as currency in small transactions. In most places uh, in the West, near the West uh, transactions were dealt with with IOUs. They were usually informal scrawls on a scrap of paper with no witnesses. And often, uh, this just proves how important pers uh, uh, per personal relationships were. The legislature of the Mississippi Territory created the Bank of Mississippi trying to deal with this problem when they built the bank here. And uh, when the legislature here decided to, uh, Jane hit me one, decided to, when the North Carolina legislature decided to print currency, John Hunt was chosen to sign it. He was one of two men chosen to sign it. You see right here is his signature, Jay Hunt. That's the way he signed everything. This is 40 shillings or two pounds. And there's another that's old. And, and two pounds right here, there's something else here. North Carolina currency. It says right here, counterfeiters beware. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm showing you is actually counterfeit. <laughs> uh, eight crowns, that's what I was looking for. Another designation here, eight crowns. Uh, this was probably the most worthless currency produced by any color or any state. It was uh, it was worthless. But they did it, and every one of those had to be printed by a printer and signed by hand by these two men. I mean, one they couldn't print the signatures. They actually had to sign. I really tried hard to find that. I, I would look on one piece of it, but uh, I haven't come up on it. Then a big, a big time opportunity came, the thing I think of the, the most. Uh, he was, in November 1788, elected to represent Hawkins County, North Carolina, at the convention to ratify the United States Constitution. Now, that's something. He was one of a few men sent from Hawkins County over here to attend this, uh, attend this convention to read the work that had been done and to say yes or no. Every, every state had to approve that. He attended two meetings. He was served as secretary at both meetings. He voted against a, a proposed change to it, and then in the end, voted in favor of ratification. I think that's a really important something. He was outspoken on public issues all, all the time. He signed a petition in favor of an unfortunate young man accused of horse theft. In 1787, he signed a petition asking that the uh, the, the separate the soon-to-be Tennessee from North Carolina, and a petition to keep the county seat in Tazewell bore his signature and that of three of his sons. Okay, Jamie, one more. Tennessee became the 16th state in 1796, and Hunt again served as a sheriff, this time with a new flavor in county, and for four years beginning in 1801. And on this, this is a plaque outside the little city hall there in Tazewell, and right here they recognize uh, some so men, the plan of the town of Tazewell, the plan of John Hunt, and, and that Nathaniel Austin Bonds, uh, sitting right there in front. I just flipped that. The meeting at which Claiborne County was formed in 1801 was held in the Hunt home in Tazewell, as was the first term of court held in 1802 in his home. And he gave land for the first church in Tazewell. All right, then. Here are some slides of uh, the minutes of Claiborne County uh, where John Hunt was elected sheriff. The, talk, the, the court ordered an election for the sheriff, came in order, and John Hunt and at least the two candidates, and they voted John Hunt had a majority. So he was elected sheriff in 1801. One more. Here he is made tax collector. The above bound John Hunt elected collector of the public monies. One more. <laughs> and then on this one, he's fined $125. Ordered by the court that John Hunt be fined $125 for an unlawful return on the rent. 
in spite of all this evidence, now I've given you, I've got a pretty good case, I think, for the fact that he's a public man. He's involved in law. He's involved in uh, working for the legislature. He's a public man. Mm -hmm. In spite of all that, what he really is, what John Hunt really was, he was a land speculator. A land speculator. In spite of all this evidence, he was a land speculator. Speculators' uh, dream of wealth uh, required him to look across those wooded fields and envision that little crossroads with a little store and a little school and kids running around, and the, having the ability to sell that vision to those people who are coming along, the newcomers. Slide. He uh, followed a pattern where men moved ahead of the settled world, often into Indian territory, and found ways to own and sell land at a profit. He had five slaves, and I think probably these slaves were used in a way to uh, in, uh, help the land, to subdivide the land, to clean the land, to get it ready to sell. Over and over, land was purchased and subdivided and sold in the three Tennessee counties, Hawkins, Sullivan, and Clayton. Now, these two jobs fit together perfectly. The job of a public servant and the job of a land speculator. <laughs> the, uh, for instance, the legislature only met two weeks at a time. So he was not spending a lot of time in the legislature. And being sheriff, he was just around where business was going on. So the, the two jobs fit together nicely. <coughs> Lengthy documentation in Hawkins County. And there I am in that little bitty room. I took that because the room was so small, just packed full of these old box, old books of, of stuff. Um, just uh, in, in, in Sullivan County alone, 96 deals were done between 1803 and when he left. The Hunts were in the land business. And when he left and came down here, his son was elected sheriff and continued the land business until 1837. Hunt decided to look south into the Mississippi Territory. Oh, I want to tell you. Uh, Ezekiel Craft is my wife's grandfather seven generations back. And he was the clerk of the of the, the, the county clerk there. And we saw his signature a lot of places. And the last piece of land John Hunt sold before he came down this way was to Ezekiel Craft. So we just kept finding great stuff. He decided to look south at the Mississippi Territory for new land opportunities, and the big spring of Alabama was on the mind of many real estate builders. The trip was certainly planned because he left a very few days after his term as sheriff ended. Leaving his family at home, he traveled with a friend, Andrew Bean, to visit and see the splendid springs north of the Great Bend of the Tennessee River. <clears throat> he came down through Winchester, he stopped right here at the Criners, right there at Mountain Fork Creek, came on down to Huntsville. Now, the Criners were the first white family in that area. John Oliver James Ditto was down here at the river at Whitesburg with a ferry in that same period. <clears throat> the trip took several weeks, 275 miles, and he wound up in Salem, Tennessee. Now, that's, if you're going up to Winchester, you cross Bean Creek when you get on 64 up there. That's Salem. Uh, near Hunter, a fine creek. And he spent the night there with, the, with friends and then came on down to the Criners and stayed there. Then came on down. The area north of the Tennessee River was still claimed by the Cherokees and the Chickasaws. Both the Criners and another family, the Davises, claimed they, uh, that Hunt later had used their logs to start his cabin near the big spring. He bought, brought his family down here, and they, when they did, they had moved, uh, they had to move their cattle and their belongings. So the trip he made was pretty quick. It was a couple of weeks to ride down here on a horse, but moving them had to take a lot longer. They were at home in February of 1806 because John's son, David, married David Larkin's daughter in Winchester. Now the Larkins, the Bains and the Hunts traveled everywhere together. When, when they moved, those three families moved together. We saw them together several times. Hunt was the advance guard of all those who were headed to the New Southwest. Washington, Washington is a tiny town on the outside of Natchez. It's the capital of the Mississippi Territory. We're way up here 
Nancy Rohr taught me long ago that if you want to find where Huntsville is, look for the double crooks in the river right there. So we're right above that. Uh, if you, uh, the, the, the governor's down here in Natchez, and he senses all this activity going on in, in Madison County. There's a lot of word uh, that people are moving in up here. The, the squatters are here. There's a lot of activity. So he decides we've got to make a county of it, and he does. He heads that way and has it, the land surveyed by Thomas Freeman using the rectangular surveys and uh, declared it to be a county in December of 1808. The census taken at that time revealed that already here in 1808, now John Hunt's been here three years, first name. In 1808, there were 2,223 men, women, and slaves here. And within four years, we were at 5,000. Fast growing place. When the federal land sales began in February of 1809, they were held in Nashville. Now, all the surveys have been completed here, so you know what you're buying. It's not like the meets and bounds of Tennessee or the earlier colonies, where it ran from the Black Oak down the creek to the two dog woods. Uh, here we go by township range and section, and it's very specific when you describe a piece of land. When the land sales began, they were held in Nashville. Thomas Freeman, the surveyor, and the man the governor had sent over here to organize all this, said, if we have the land sales in Nashville, there won't be a lot of comfort. Uh, we'll avoid the, uh, the neighbors looking across the fence at each other. They'll be able to bid freely on whatever they want, and the people who don't have much money won't be up there bidding. They thought that was a very good, uh, very good bet. The whole idea was to sell this land and pay off the Revolutionary War bid. Everywhere the federal government got the land, that was their plan, was to pay off that debt with land. So this was stepping in that direction. Taxes, then, like now, are not paid. All land was priced at $2 an acre. That's where every, every bit of the land started. When, you, when you're in Nashville, you see a piece of your land, you say, I want to bid on this section right here, uh, they'll call it up for auction. If nobody nobody uh, competes with you on it, you pay $2 an acre. <clears throat> the most desirable part of this whole county was the big spring. Leroy Polk bought it for $23.50 an acre. $23.50 an acre. Now that meant there had to be several people bidding. So Leroy Polk didn't go in there and just bid $23.50. It started at $2. John Hunt probably bid a time or two. But he saw he couldn't match this. That, that, that was out of his price range. John Hunt bought, uh, Leroy Polk bought John Hunt's home. So he had to get off that land. He had to do something. So on August the 29th and September the 18th, he bought two quarter sections right here. Here's the spring. Here's what John Hunt bought a few days later. And then about a month later. Now these two pieces are about where the Cadillac dealership is. It's on the creek. It's down the creek a little bit. And I remember when I was in the National Guard, uh, one time we had to haul people out of there when it flooded one time. I think that, th that John Hunt found this land. He's in Nashville. He buys it. He comes home. He reacts to Leroy Polk getting his home by buying something. And he, he comes home and finds that creek is not really that good down there. The ground is awful low. It's not something I can make some money on or want to live on. He lets it go back. When you buy land, you pay 5% back. 5% of $2 times 160 It is not a big loss for it. Yes? I don't want to go to the Cadillac dealership. Let me find somebody. Anybody got a Cadillac? <laughs> you can help John. The Cadillac dealership is on, a little south of here on the parkway. Uh, maybe a mile south of here on the parkway on the west side. If if you all are old enough to that you know that that was always a swampy swampy area. So he lets these go back. I think at that time his son-in-law is buying land that is now the old Huntsville Airport, the Aikman. His name is Aikman. He buys land at the airport, and I think that's probably where John Hunt goes when he has to get off this land. But in October, he goes up here on Limestone Creek, a very nice creek up here, and buys 160 acres for $2. He keeps that six years. 
themselves in. Uh, we don't know really where he lived or what he did uh, after after this. Uh, I'm, this is a supposition about where he lived and what he did after John after Little Lord Pope walked home. But um, we 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 don't know where he died or where he was buried, really. Although there are people who say they do. Much knowledge about his surroundings served those who laid out the county and new roads, and his children were valued and valuable members of the community. It's clear he was held in high regard when the populace chose to name the town for him. And in 1810, the governor named him coroner for a four-year term. Now about 60 years old, he was a member with Leroy Pope and all the big movers and shakers of the Masonic Lodge. He became a master mason. His grandson reported his death from consumption in 1882, although I read that in a letter. I'm not sure about it. Some think he's buried out on the airport. Others believe he's buried up in Salem, Tennessee, where his another son stayed on, on Bean Creek there. He was a soldier, a lawman, a politician, a guide, a land speculator, and he was dependable and vigorous and well-respected. It is proper that this city bears the name of this resourceful and well adapted man of his time. Now that's my story. <laughs> I think we proved that he, he was not the wandering uh, ruffian that many of us thought. Yes, sir. How old was he when he died? Well, I, I was, he was, he was probably 65 to 70, something like that. If he was, if he died in, in uh, 1822, uh, he was born in 1750. So that's a guess. That's all. Yes, sir. When he got to the big spring, had anyone else been there before him? The story goes that the Davis, if y'all know Jimmy Davis, I think, probably the attorney that used to be working here. Mm -hmm. Jimmy and, and the Criers both, have, I have letters written by them that are of uh, a much older time telling that John Hunt used their laws. Uh, so they were here. And of course, if you're familiar with the Yazoo land scheme that went on where the Georgia legislature sold all this property back in the mid 1700s, white men had been all over here. Uh, the government hated it. Every, every uh, uh, treaty we made with the Indians says we will protect the, you from the white men. In fact, George Washington said federal troops out several times, and Adams did, to move white uh, settlers off of Indian territory. They didn't want them in here, but they were here, and they came to this day. Um, I think also I have a letter that uh, someone, I can't remember the man's name, left Ditto's Landing, he and a black man, on a wagon, came up to the big spring to water their horses, and, and John Hunt and his son were trying to erect those logs. And they stopped and helped them get them up. Uh, so there was plenty of white people around and things going on here. The Indians ceded this land to the federal government in uh, in this period, about 1812, I think. I'm, somebody in here can tell us. Nancy can tell us. Okay. That's that's when this uh, that's when it became actively a county and and subdivided and ready to say it was all Indians. Well, that was that was much later. That was 1830. So, so there were Indians here, but were they not? They were still around. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And part down at Owens Crossroads was, was still Indian property during this period of time. Uh, Leroy Pope and John Hunt get along after Leroy Pope brought his down. You know, that's a good question. Uh, and, and we can make another talk here about Leroy Pope. I hope somebody will really dig into him and write because uh, he's over in Petersburg, Georgia, and he's Mr. Big over there. He owns the warehouses. Uh, I read that he's swindled his father-in-law out of a cotton crop. You know, <laughs> just, he, was, he was after the money. His target was money. Uh, when he comes over here, he brings, uh, he brings a lot of his friends. In fact, the Isham Watkins, to whom I'm kin, uh, was within that crowd. 
Uh, these guys with money come over here, and that's when this, this county really turns into something. When they start buying this land and clearing it, they've got the slaves and the know-how, and they begin clearing land, growing cotton, and making money. Uh, I don't know how they got along, John, but they were in the Masons together. I know that. And uh, I know that uh, Hunt was a coroner, and so they had to get along. Uh, Hope, was, Hope was head of everything. He was head of the bank. Uh, you know, he, he had his finger in every time. They did, uh, at one time, the, the, uh, the city was named Twickenham for a few years, but the, legis the Mississippi, Terri legis le uh, Mississippi Territory Legislature in 1811 voted to make turn it back to Huntsville. So that's, that's the way that happened. Uh, when it was named Twickenham, it was not an act of a government, I don't think, or if it was, it was a very lightweight government. It was just one. It was Hunt Spring, then Twickenham, and then Huntsville. Thank you, David.